Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Welcome, welcome. First of all, happy spring. Happy International Women's History Month and uh, happy Global Women Peace Network Forum. We welcome you from around the world. I just heard that we have participants from Canada, from Portugal, from France, from Africa, Uganda, and uh, from the United States, of course, and Spain, and uh, really from around the world. So thank you, women leaders coming together and women of all backgrounds. We're so grateful that we have this third session of the Global Women Peace Network entitled Women's Leadership of Reconcil in Reconciliation and Peacemaking. And today's title is The Next Generation. My name is Angelica Sully. I'm the president of Women's Federation USA. I'm again your host this time. And I just want to say, you know, if you are a woman, then please celebrate yourself right now, if you haven't done it so, because in the month of women's history, where we celebrate women, we honor and recognize and, and uplift all the contributions that women have made throughout history and for humanity. Would you not agree? So a round of applause for all women in the world, those before us, those with us, and for those who come after us. So it's a beautiful day here in Maryland where I am, the sun is shining. We wanna bring hope. That's the purpose of this seminar. We seek to bring hope, we seek to bring vision and also practical tools for women and men to navigate through these difficult times that we find ourselves in. So when our committee was planning this forum for today, we felt it was quite apropos to actually turn to the next generation of young women to find out how they feel, how they contribute to peace and to a better environment. And so we interviewed a few of them and the ladies you will see today are amazing. I just want to tell you that right now. We have amazing women leaders coming in today, so I look forward to that. And so um, before I go into introducing them, I'd like to share a little bit more about the Global Women Peace Network. We've heard that name many times, but today I want to go a little deeper and just say, for me, first of all, it is a network of the heart, network of women organizations coming together. First of all, it is a project of the Women's Federation for World Peace International. And it was uh, launched in 2012 by Dr. Hakja Moon and her late husband, uh, Reverend Dr. Samuel Moon, to bring together NGOs, decision makers, institutions, government, collaborate in uh, using their resources, com 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 uh, converging their resources to create a better future for us all. So it is uh, Women's Federation itself has been launched in 1992. 29 years old next month. Amazing. And uh, it was launched and founded for the arrival to announce the arrival of the era of women. And we do feel women are needed now more than ever to bring solutions to the table, right? So um, the three areas of impact that we are having is number one, women's leadership. And we feel that in a peace culture that we're trying to establish we need a new type of leadership, paradigm, a paradigm where masculine and feminine on equal footing work together, harmonize and enhance each other's strengths, providing a place for the next generation to grow up in security and support. Number two, we also support family. We see the family as the most fundamental and natural unit in society. It's a place where a husband and a wife are sharing their life, love and core values where culture is trans transmitted and tools that are necessary for good citizenship and for this new culture of peace that we're working on. And number three, the environment, of course, the earth is our home. It belongs to humanity collectively. It needs to be treated with respect and with awe and cultivated and shared with the intention to enhance and develop and protect the next generation. Of course, that includes our spiritual environment, which is quite toxic at this time. We find ourselves in crazy, uh, disturbing times still. So I hope that, we hope that this seminar, this webinar can be an uplift, can be an oasis in the wilderness, if you will, as you hear good ideas coming forward. And we will also have a moment to share today. We'll have a few new uh, components 
that we're surprising you with. So stay tuned. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce now our very first speaker. Her name is Mrs. Elizabeth Yang. Mrs. Yang is the owner and founder of the Law and Mediation Offices of Elizabeth Yang, has over a decade of legal experiences and is recognized by Thomson Reuters as a super lawyer. Her firm specializes in family law, business law, intellectual property, and estate planning and has offices in Southern California and Taipei. At the age of 19, she earned the, the bachelor's in science in electrical engineering and computer science from UC Berkeley in 2.5 years. She then earned the ID MBA from the University of, of Laverne, as well as her mediation certification with the Los Angeles County Bar Association. Get this, Elizabeth is a best-selling author and has published five books to date. Amazing, this is worth a celebration, ladies. Let's give her a round of applause. She's to me, I just met her by the way. <laughs> she is a woman of passion, of focus, and she gets something, she gets stuff done. So here we go, Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Angelica. Um, and uh, it's such a pleasure to be here with all of you fabulous, amazing women celebrating Women's History Month. Um, first of all, I wanted to do a special thank you to uh, Chu Fun and uh, her daughter, Angie, for inviting me to speak today to all of you. Um, they've been amazing. I, I met up with them a couple of weeks ago and uh, so glad for this opportunity. So I wanted to start off by sharing a little bit of my background before I get into like the subject matter of today's talk. Um, so I am a mom. I have two children. Uh, my, my daughter is turning 12 next month. My son is 10. And I, I started my own business uh, about uh, 10 years ago because when I had my kids, I was working for a large law firm at that time. And I don't know if you guys know about big law culture. They treat their associate attorneys like slaves. You're working 80 hours a week, you know, aiming to build 2000 hours a year, and you basically have no life whatsoever. So I was like, done with that after I had my first child, because I was not seeing my daughter, you know, I was going to work early in the morning, going home late at night, my nanny was basically raising my my daughter for me. And so I was like, something's got to change. And that's why I came out and um, decided to open my own business because that would offer me the flexibility to have a career and also be a mother at the same time. You know, women, we we're devoted to our families, to our children. Like they're, they're just so important to us. It's, it's difficult for us to put career first above, you know, everything else. And so in order for us to have a career and have children, family, we got to learn to figure out a way to balance everything. And so I felt like having my own my own business really allowed me to do that. But there's there's a lot of other ways to do so as well. And I saw like the big partners, the big female partners at the law firm I was working for, they would wait until their late 30s, sometimes early 40s to have children because they wanted to make sure their career was secure first before jumping into family. You know, because it was like the, 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 everyone knew, like, if you started to have a family, you're not going to go up in your career. You know, the partners are not going to uh, promote you to partner because they know that your heart's going to be somewhere else. And so folks were not having families until, you know, they were a lot older and then they would have a lot of complications with their pregnancies, you know, have a lot of health issues and then the babies would have issues too. So, you know, it's a, it's a big balance and I acknowledge all of you women for balancing work and life and family and career and everything that we do, you know, it's, it's a tough balancing act. Um, how many of you guys are mothers here? Oh my gosh, almost everybody. And a lot of uh, to-be mothers as well. I know Angie is a to-be mother, mother-to-be. <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about. You know how difficult it is to balance everything. And so um, coming from that background, um, I wanted to share with you guys the topic of emotional intelligence and how that's helped me in my background and my career. Has anyone taken like transformational trainings. Um, raise your hand if you're familiar with transformational trainings or emotional intelligence. 
Okay, just a couple of hands. All right. So I'll share with you. Um, in 2010, uh, when my kids were pretty young, they were one and two, um, I found out that my ex-husband was cheating on me. And so I filed for divorce. And back then I was an intellectual property attorney. I did not specialize in family law yet. I had never filed a divorce ever in my life for any client. And so I started my ordeal um, filing the divorce. And I didn't know at the time, but my divorce ended up taking four years. It was four years of lots of court hearings, constant battles in court, lots of expensive attorney bills. And you know, even at, at the four year mark, um, we still couldn't finalize our case because we just had so much negative energy towards each other and so much anger, you know, and we were just fighting for child custody, fighting for child support, whatever we could fight over, we were fighting over. And so at that time in 2014, I was introduced to em emotional intelligence training. And at that time, I had gone through college, I had gotten my bachelor's, I had gone through law school, I had gone through MBA, like all this education, but nowhere in my years of education did any system teach me about emotional intelligence. You know, they would teach me about math, science, history, English, uh, law, you know, all the academic topics, but there was no education on uh, active communication, on conflict resolution, you know, on how to make a marriage work, how to make a relationship work, how, how to let go of a bad relationship, you know, how to handle bad children, you know, children who won't listen to you, how to resolve conflicts in, in with your husband, you know, with your spouse. They're like all these things were never taught to us in schools. And so even with all my years of education, I had no idea what to do with my ex-husband in a relationship where, where we were literally trying to kill each other in court, you know, and we had two kids together. So it, we were just stuck. And so many people are stuck too, you know, educated, uneducated uh, women, men, like they get stuck in these situations. But after I went through this emotional intelligence training, uh, which is offered around the world. Um, I, I took it with a center in, uh, in Los Angeles called Mastery and Transformational Trainings, but there's a lot of other centers out there. And so these trainings taught me um, all this emotional EQ stuff that I wish would have been taught in the public school systems. So from that, um, I learned the difference between being a victim and taking responsibility. Um, I learned that energy flows where your focus goes. Write that, write that down. Energy flows where your focus goes, All right? So if something's negative and happening in your life, if you put your energy there because you wanna be right, because you wanna win, because you wanna get justice, you know, or whatever your reason is, that negative energy is going to perpetrate your entire life and you're just going to be bitter and negative no matter what you're doing you're going to be complaining to your friends about this negative thing that's happening and that that energy is just going to flow in your whole life because that's where your focus goes and so after i took my training i i texted my ex-husband and i was like can we sit down and have lunch together you know, uh, I know it's your birthday coming up next month. Let me take you out for a birthday lunch. And he was like shocked getting my text. I had not wished him a happy birthday in four years. And so it took him three whole days to respond to me. And finally, after three days, he was like, okay, you know, I'm going to have lunch with you. I don't know what you're up to, but I'll have lunch with you. So we sat down for lunch and I told him like, look, I've learned that it doesn't serve me to be a victim anymore and to make you the bad person. So, you know, I can keep making you the bad person, keep giving you my power and keep being your victim and keep be being right about it. Or I can take responsibility for my, uh, my part in this whole relationship. You know, nobody forced me to walk down the wedding aisle with you. Nobody forced me to marry you and have two children with you. You know, those are my choices. I chose you and, you know, I, I get to claim my results and take responsibility. 
And going forward, after I'm able to take that responsibility, I can choose what kind of relationship we have going forward. You know, that comes into my power. And I choose that I want to have a loving, respectful, understanding relationship with you going forward for the sake of our children. I don't want to fight anymore. And he listened. He was like, you know, that sounds pretty nice, but don't blame me if I have a hard time believing the words that are coming out of your mouth because we have been going to court for four years. And I said, it's okay. You don't have to believe me. You know, my actions will speak louder than words. And so in the next six months, I, all my actions and intentions were positive. You know, I focused my energy on positivity. If he wanted the kids for a weekend that I was uh, that wasn't convenient for me, I'll still let him. You know, I'll, I'll help him out. You know, if, if he's not able to take care of the kids and he wants to give them to me, I'll help him out. It's okay. You know, like I just went above and beyond to create this positive, loving relationship. And fast forward seven years later, we still have an amazing friendship. You know, I just with those little bits of lesson learned, we've been able to maintain that. I'm like great friends with his girlfriend now. He gets along with my husband. We have play dates for the kids. And it's like an amazing, loving, extended relationship that my children get to grow up in because of my willingness to take responsibility and to alter my actions and my interpretations. You know, he didn't have to change anything on his end. It was all me. You know, and taking these lessons going forward, you guys can apply that in anything. You know, my my uh, I had a business partner before and I found out he was um, embezzling money as well. Instead of uh, I could have I could have uh, taken him to court, filed a lawsuit for breach of fiduciary duty. I could have probably claimed a lot of money back that he was owing, but I chose to just let it go and not focus my energy on negative negativity focus my energy on positively building my own business, on recreating and, uh, you know, doing the positive work for myself. And in turn, I, I, I think my business is so successful right now because I didn't devote my time to suing him and to that negative energy. So um, I welcome you guys, you know, whatever challenge you're going through in your life, at this moment, pick and choose. There's a positive option that you can take, and there's a negative option that you can take. And with the negative option, there's definitely payoffs. There's gonna be, you know, you can you can say I'm right, you can say I'm getting justice, you know, like like that that person deserves it. How can I just let it go? You know, you can be right about it and, and choose the negative option. There's definitely payoffs. That's why people keep choosing the negative option. But now you know you have a choice. You can choose the positive option and believe in karma because karma goes there. What goes around comes around. If you forgive someone and you let something go, some, another door is going to open for you. And then if that person gets a freebie from you, you know, took advantage of you, it's going to come around and bite them in the butt. You know, you don't need to be the one to get revenge. Karma will take care of the job for you. So um, I don't know how I am doing on time. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's time. time. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's time. I can I can talk for like hours and hours, <laughs> but that's just my ten minute spiel. Um, I yeah. hope that was helpful for you guys and happy Women's History Month. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. It was awesome. Uh, profound words and wisdom shared, universal. I would say, choose your fights. Pick pick if you want to do positive or negative, right? Uh, or do you want to engage in where 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 energy flows, that's where you, what did you say? Energy flows where your energy focus Energy flows like, where your focus goes. Where your focus goes. Energy flows where your focus goes, ladies. Remember so that. So focus on the positive. Focus on the positive. Thank you so much. Very wise words for peace building indeed. So our next speaker is Ms. Hanalyn Colvin. Ms. Hanalyn Colvin is a poet and spoken word artist who features regularly in, in venues from Baltimore to New York. She tackles the complex issues of love, sex, race, and cultural bigotry through her lyrical poetry and powerfully spoken word. She has won, she has won praise for her performances as an actress. Here we have an actress here with us on the community theater scenes for such roles as Phoebe in the show Months on End 
and Cassie Cooper in the show Rumors. Uh, Hannah, Lynn is, Hannah Lynn is also a conservative political activist. She served as the media and communications director for the Eugene Bolkai City Council campaign in 2020 and currently appears as a co-host of Pop and Politics, a weekly Baltimore-based talk show for the Smart Edge Urban Conservatives. So we really welcome another amazingly accomplished woman who makes an impact in with her gifts and talents. Go ahead, uh, Ms. Colvin, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much. Can can everybody hear me okay with my headset? <laughs> so I'm doing this little makeshift room in my office the middle of the day, but we're <laughs> we're making it work. So um, thank you so much for inviting me. It's an honor uh, to be able to just to speak from my heart to everybody. I'm going to just focus on what some of my experience my experiences have been. Uh, being able to use poetry as a way of building bridges and connecting and really um, building human connection uh, with people across different avenues and walks of life and different cultural backgrounds, which I think is so important um, today, given, you know, how many contentious issues there are right now, especially surrounding uh, racial divisions in the country. Uh, so for the past 20 years, I've been performing poetry um, from Baltimore up to New York. I kind of cut my teeth in the New York scene, the New York spoken word scene. Um, there was an interview that James Baldwin, great Black American writer, um, that he gave uh, back in the 1960s, and um, it just, when I heard it, it really struck me, and it, it has stayed with me, and it resonates, um, and I think that it's something that has been um, such a, a powerful part of what I have attempted to do through my poetry, um, and it illustrates the power in, um, in connecting human to human um, through our shared experiences. So he said, you can go through your life for a very long time and you think no one has ever suffered the way that I've suffered. My God, my God. And then you realize you read something or you hear something and you realize that your suffering does not isolate you. Your suffering is your bridge, that many people have suffered before you, many people are suffering around you and always will. And all you can do is bring hopefully a little light into that suffering, enough light so that the person who is suffering can begin to comprehend his suffering and begin to live with it and begin to change it. So poetry is a very powerful avenue for, ch for channeling these deep emotions. And it's a way that we can forge these connections between people who maybe we look and we, we see uh, people coming from different backgrounds and different experiences. And we think there's no way to bridge these divides. And that we are so, the message that's really being pushed, I think, today in mainstream culture and in politics is that this divide is insurmountable, that we cannot bridge it, that we are so different across different races or cultures or ethnicities or between the sexes that we cannot bridge this divide. And my experience through poetry has been that poetry is really, it is a, a place where people are often the most vulnerable and they are sharing of themselves and they're sharing their personal experiences and often from a very deep place of hurt and from pain and they're just laying themselves open. Um, it's, a, it's a way that you can cut through all of the external differences and the external factors and you really begin to see people just on a human level for who they are. And oftentimes through that experience of suffering because you can realize that I may not have suffered the way that this other person has suffered, but we have both suffered. And so I can use that as the basis, as the foundation to be able to have empathy and to see this other person as a fellow human being, as a brother, as a sister in God, and that there is more that connects us and more that unites us than divides us. So when I, um, I moved up to New York when I was 19, and like I said, I got very involved in the spoken word poetry scene. It was predominantly, I was performing in predominantly Black venues. It was, uh, it was 
very, it was a profound experience because I was able to expand my own perspective and to learn more profoundly about experiences that were being shared from Black Americans, learning about just more of, more deeply about the, you know, the history, the racial wounds and the tensions that still exist today from this kind of legacy of our racist past in America and understanding how it was still resonating with people today. Um, my husband, my late husband who's passed away was a black man. So we were in an interracial relationship and I was able to use my poetry to explore the dynamics of that, what it meant, what it meant in terms of combining you know, our lineage, um, what it would mean for our children if we had had the opportunity to have children who would be coming from these two different cultural and racial backgrounds. And the experiences that I was having, having grown up, you know, in a, a predominantly white neighborhood, community, schools, and um, was being confronted with or having my eyes open to things that I wasn't aware of just because of my own personal experiences, but through joining my personhood with his through the un through our union, that where now we were coming together as one, that I was able to see things from a different perspective or see things from his perspective or see, you know, comments that were being made, reactions to, from both from black people and white people to our relationship. And um that, that were really eye-opening. And so through, po through poetry, through be being able to explore those experiences that I was having, it was a way to, um, to really um, try to express and build these relationships, um, like I said, across these uh, super, uh, ultimately superficial, surface differences and to really see how um, how connected ultimately we all are. Um, there is a, um, I think that that being able to to connect in that way very deeply, um, to be able to share those personal stories, the personal pain, to be able to um, to experience through poetry, oftentimes you can say things that maybe people would have a hard time hearing if you were just coming at them with, um, with facts or logic. There's something that's very transformative about uh, tapping into that essence of a person, tapping into their heart and their spirit and the emotion. Um, the caveat to that is that also comes from a very feminine place. The emotion is, um, there is something that is archetypically feminine about our emotions. And that can be both positive and negative. There's a very positive force to emotion, which is what, um, what can connect us, the power of that emotion, giving, um, using the, the emotion to give life to these experiences and to connect with each other. Um, it goes back to the idea of emotions, the feminine divine being kind of represented by the, the waters of the deep. There's always this uh, in mythology, this language of the feminine being both like the waters of the womb that give birth, but it can also be the waters of chaos that consume you and can drown you. So there is a caveat to being uh, stuck in a place of emotion um, that with poetry can be very seductive almost. You know, the one thing that I had noticed recently is that on the poetry scene and what we're seeing in our uh, discussions culturally and politically is that a lot of people are getting stuck in the negative aspect, the negative emotions and the emotions of grievance and the emotions of grief. And instead of using that as a, a, a place to be able to build from and to work through and to, to bridge, to use that suffering as a bridge between people, what's my worry is that what's happening now is too often people are using it as a, as a chasm in order to divide. And so I think that going forward, 
um, we as women have to be very conscious of the fact that we're not getting trapped in a cycle of negative emotions, but that, that we're not getting stuck in, like Elizabeth mentioned, um, a cycle of perpetual victimhood, but that we're able to use the suffering that people have experienced, use our personal suffering, use our collective suffering, use the suffering that different groups, different, you know, uh, groups in this country who have suffered from discrimination and oppression, use that experience of suffering, but as a way towards healing and a way towards reconciliation. And like James Baldwin said, a way of recognizing that that suffering is at the same time personal and intimate, but at the same time universal. And that's the way that through art, through truth, through the power of poetry, the power of emotion, that we can begin to see each other as fully human and be able to use that suffering through the transformative power of art in order to bring about peace and healing. Amazing, amazing. Uh, I mean, uh, Hannah Lynn, Hannah Lynn, you gave us so much to think about. I cannot even repeat. I was touched with so many points. But what I see, first of all, both ladies, first of all, thank you. You both have gone through a lot in your age already, right? You've gone through so many difficult situations and you are able to tackle them in different ways through the emotion code is one and through your realization through the word and the common suffering which we're all going through right now. And I think it's kind of like a rebirth, isn't it? If we do it, in the, if we go through it mm -hmm. well, and we come mm -hmm. out on the other end better. Just a couple of comments to, each, comments to each of you before we open it up for question and answer. So this is uh, from Marie to uh, Hannah Lynn. A lot of people forgive and forget, but they don't face it. Very important. Thank you for this wonderful testimony about talking to your husband and challenging him to work together. Wait a minute, was that for Elizabeth? <laughs> I think it was for Elizabeth. Uh, here's another one. Elizabeth, your story and experiences you've shared with us is so empowering. Love the fact that you focus on positivity that gives energy. And I think we, we both spoke about emotions and who addresses emotions, not the men, right? Mm -hmm. The women as the other half of humanity. We are dealing with emotions all the time and then we are able to transform them. I think a lot more comments will be coming through because you just ended your amazing uh, presentation, uh, Hannah Lynn. But here's a question. Uh, question number one from Katerina. How do you, Elizabeth, now create an environment in your law firm for women to be able to healthy, healthily balance work and family? Do you have any comments on that? That's a great question. So I've actually created this formula for my uh, employees where they get to choose their own salary based on how many hours they want to work. So they get to choose their own work-life balance. Um, for big law, the salaries are all set and the hours are all set. You know, like first years out of law school, you make 190,000 and you have to build 2150 hours. For second year, it's another amount. You know, it's all public information. If you Google big law salary, you'll see a chart with the fixed amounts. So what I do is I make it proportional. If you want to work half of the hours, you get half of the salary. If you want to work 70% of the hours, you get 70% of the salary. So every employee gets to choose their own work-life balance. Awesome. This should be adapted nationally, shouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you ladies I are blazing the trail. Yeah, go ahead. I think that's uh, great because that empowers women to be able to choose what they want. Because I think there's a lot of pressure being put on women that we're supposed to compete in the workplace the way that a man would. And sometimes women just want to make a different choice and to be able to have that freedom to choose differently. Absolutely. So there was another question to you, Elizabeth. Um, how do you bring the knowledge of emotional intelligence? in your job as you advise your clients? I actually pay for my employees to go through the emotional intelligence training. Oh so when, <laughs> yeah, so I know how much has benefited me. And so all my employees, they go through the training and they don't have to pay a penny. They, the firm pays for everything. And then even some of my clients um, who I've shared the story with, you know, my story, I, I was sharing in the chat that they can go through a difficult divorce, spend all their money on the attorneys, or they can learn from my mistakes 
and settle their case, focus on positivity. And many of my clients have also gone through emotional intelligence training because of, you know, they want to follow my footsteps and create the positivity that I've been able to create. That is great. Instead of complaining about your employees, you help them. <laughs> <laughs> of course, yes. Yes, you know, it's the getting is in the giving. You know, we, we can only earn so much and do so much for ourselves. Life is about giving and contribution. Wonderful, wonderful. So uh, to you, uh, Hannah Lynn, um, did you experience and witness positive changes in your family environment as a result of your poetry? And further, several ladies requested a taste of your poetry, if you could <laughs> add that in. <laughs> sure, certainly. <laughs> um, Let's see, did I, yes, there have been times when, um, well, I came from a, a family of artists. My dad was a poet. Um, my, my dad was very influential in my um, development as an artist because I used to go with him when I was a child to open mics. And so that was my first taste of really performing. So it really, the poetry and art had always been such a fundamental, essential part of our household and of growing up. And it really was a way that we were able to, like that we always knew was a way of expressing emotion. Um, so it, it just kind of uh, continued to develop. My dad, uh, my dad used to say that I would start going to the open mics as a, a child with him and I was known as Alex's daughter. And then when I started to make my mark on the scene, he would go to open mics and he was known as Honolin's father. So the roles reversed, but yeah, so there just had always been this um, appreciation for art as a way of um, uniting people. My dad also, he passed away a year and a half ago and it just, there was such an outpouring of love and, and support and supportive messages from people who had been so touched by his art, by his songs, by his music, by his poetry, that I think that was something that already, it wasn't something I brought to the family, it was something that I learned from my dad, that there's a way of really touching people. And again, my dad was, um, you know, like the, the Taoist um, uh, principle of flowing like water from the highest to the lowest. You know, my dad would go everywhere and talk with everyone. And he just always would, you know, would find a way of relating to people just on a artistic level. And he was able to do that very often through his music and through his poetry. So that was just something that I, you know, I, I learned that from my father. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. Yeah, so we can influence emotions that way too, right? Mm -hmm. We can go to the emotion code, but we can also use words. Would you share with us a few? Do you have some available? Some some of excerpt, a couple of lines, just to get a feel for it? Oh, sure. So I, I have a poem. I wrote it for a female friend of mine. So it's a poem celebrating women. Um, oh, it's short. Oh, appropriate. <laughs> Right. Yeah, okay. this okay. actually was my, my go-to point. Whenever I would be invited to feature at events in March for Women's History Month, this was my, <laughs> this was my Women's History Month poem. <laughs> All right, right on. Uh, it's, it's, called, it's called Blessing. Um, and I had written it and dedicated it to a friend of mine who was going through a difficult period and she was so anxious for things to work out and so impatient for things to work out and I was telling her from my experience she was saying like I see where you are in your life and your relationship and things are so good and I want to be there and I said but you understand you you have to go through the journey I didn't start at this point I went through a journey so you have to allow the journey to unfold um, so it's called this is called blessing be patient sister your blessing is coming Wait for it, like summer waits for snow, like desert waits for rain, be patient, sister, it is coming. As surely as redemption, as fiercely as fire, feel it in each fertile breath you take, taste it in each memory of future you are meant to make. Exhale all your fears into the flames and let them burn, for as fire burns, it cleanses, and as it cleanses, it restores. So as we store our sorrows in the flames, we release them into the ashes to be reborn. We mourn no more, long to linger in the past no longer, for the future burns before our eyes with the satisfaction of a deferred dream realized 
Be patient, sister, your blessing is near. Don't you know that God counts a woman's tears, replaces each one with holy water so that every step you take is blessed, makes miracles out of misery and stress, bakes bread to feed your soul out of the yeast of your prayers and the heat of your determination. Woman, you hold the womb of the world in the palms of your hands, rub your palms together and birth nations. Just be patient. Your oh my goodness. Woo, ladies. We want to publish that if we may. <laughs> oh, sure. I could email you the text of it so that you can. Okay. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. That is powerful. Thank you so much. You can see your talent and give just a, uh, how you recite it. It's just, uh, it's, it's music. It's, it's art. <laughs> it really Thank is you. art. Yeah, I do want to correct myself, by the way, Elizabeth, I'm sorry, I said emotion code, but it's emotional intelligence that you're working with, right? <laughs> and, uh, I also want to make a comment, I think we come to the end of our uh, Q&A, you know, you both have taken ownership, what we call it, you are proactive, you're not succumbing to situations and challenges and pain and suffering, you know, you lost your husband and your husband left you, you know, you found a way, you know, to make lemonade out of lemons, <laughs> That's the word. So stay positive, right? There's so many wonderful comments still. We don't have time to read them all. But um, would we now, uh, would you be open to make a closing statement? And I know there's so much more. Ladies on the call and gentlemen, this was a feast for me and I hope for you too, in terms of getting sustenance here, words, inspiration, guidance for our lives, right? So we navigate through these difficult times. And the, the ladies agreed to stay um, available for further questions and they will make their emails available, right? So yeah, Elizabeth, would you make a closing statement, please? Well, it's uh, been so nice to you know talk to all of you. You guys were so active and engaging and participating. Um, this is my first interaction with the Global Peace Network. So just really, really awesome to be here. And I invite you all, um, you know, Hannah Lynn and I, we are paying it forward by giving our time here. So for all of you, if each of you go out and pay it forward in any small token that you can do something nice for someone, smile at a stranger on the street today, the, the ripple effect is amazing. So I invite all of you to just pay it forward in celebration of Women's History Month today. Beautiful, beautiful. Bravo, ladies. Uh, Elizabeth, it was awesome to have you. And now, uh, Hannah Lynn, your final comments. So I just want to thank you again, and thank you to everybody and um, for all of your kind <laughs> responses to the poem. And you can find the poem on my website. Somebody pointed out in the comments at hannahlynn.com. That poem actually is up there. Please check out Pop and Politics. Um, you can find it on Facebook or YouTube on Metro Conservative Media. And we have a lot of, uh, we have a, a panel of five women and we um, have very lively, energetic discussions every Wednesday night. So um, I think that's uh, it's another way that, you know, I've been working through a different avenue to try to, um, to really, to bring about, you know, peace and, and unity and harmony. And I think there's a great energy among all of these women. Um, we come from, again, different backgrounds, different races and different histories. And the way that we're all able to, again, to just see each other, to find that there's more that unites us than divides us and really just, um, just to be mindful of using, you know, your personal experiences, the emotion and the sorrow that we all go through, not as um, something to get mired in, but something to be able to use as a transformative power towards healing. The, the muse, um, the, you know, the nine muses in Greek Roman mythology, they were the daughters of memory. And so, you know, our art is a way of memorializing. It is a way of memorializing a time, an event, a place, a person, but we also have to keep moving forward. So, you know, the muse can be an inspiration, but the muse can also keep you, you know, when you muse on something, when you are, you know, thinking, pondering, when you are ruminating, you can get stuck in that place. So just to try to continue as we're moving forward, um, as women trying to bring, you know, unite people through uh, world peace to use the muse as an inspiration and to keep moving forward in a spirit of peace and unity and love. 
That sounds excellent. It's all recorded, by the way, ladies. You can hear those beautiful comments again. And uh, I want to repeat that life is about giving and contribution, right? That was mentioned. You don't want to forget those keywords that are kind of uh, resonating in many different ways. That's the beauty of this panel. You're very, very different, but yet the message is very similar, isn't it? So thank you again, uh, wonderful, powerful young women leaders. We wish you well in your careers, wherever it may take you. And uh, so thank you. And now to our audience, uh, we have a surprise for you. And that is we, we will see a video clip of another artist, a young woman who makes a difference in her own way for peace. And uh, it's a, a Korean artist, her name is Miss Ji, Ji Young Park. Young Park, she cannot be here with us today, but she created this video for this occasion. So a brief word about her, Ji Young Park is an LA based calligrapher. She has exhibited and performed in various cities in Europe, North America and Korea and produced works for a variety of clients, including the YG Entertainment, Deutsche Börse Group, Mercedes-Benz, among many others. So ladies, let's enjoy this video, which she prepared for you. Hi, my name is Jian Park. I'm a calligrapher based in LA and I'm um, really excited to be part of this wonderful event organized by the Women's Federation for World Peace, which is one of the most active NGOs listed in the UN. Yeah, I just wanted to tell you that I truly, I truly believe that women, especially the younger generation, has so much to give to restore human values. And I hope you'll be able to feel it through this video. feel a different energy around the younger generation <laughs> amazing very creative very powerful as uh, this young lady is restoring human values in her own way making people smile giving meaning and joy back to the people so thank you uh, miss park <laughs> so moving on we have another surprise here today for you we are actually having breakout session for 10 minutes we're going to give you the opportunity to share with each other and to discuss uh, a topic related to Women's History Month. And uh, we'll have two questions for you to answer. And there's no one leading the discussion, so feel free to share with each other, get to know each other. Uh, the first question is, what did you take away from the session that inspired you in your current leadership uh, role or wanting to be a leader? Because we believe every woman is a leader in, in some way, right? How does it apply to your life, number one? Number two, what struck you that could help younger women? So the first one is, what did you take away from the session for yourself as a woman leader or woman leader to be? And how do you apply it? And then second, what struck you most uh, 
to uh, what struck you that could help uh, younger women. Welcome back, ladies. Oh my goodness, what a rich discussion. I hope you had one too. <laughs> it was amazing. Um, just lady speakers, I want to say how appreciated you are. Comments were made like, you know, uh, for Elizabeth, that she has the heart of a mother. You should be the, the teacher of all lawyers, okay? <laughs> Things like that. And that both of the ladies have given us so many tools to transform ourselves and also give hope to the next generation because you worked from the inside out. Just to summarize a little bit of my own uh, breakout, and we had a, one lady from Canada and from the LA. I felt very much enriched. I just hope that you will continue the conversation, please, because this is only the beginning, right? If you continue to bring it up in our lives and talk with our families like that, I think we can get the ball rolling in a greater nation <laughs> and the world, right? Um, we have to move on. But you know what? I'm determined to bring each and every one of these ladies back to a webinar or something. <laughs> they have so much more to share. Um, and now we have time for, we're going to have a special announcement on our initiative called Global Friends. And I will call on our outreach director, Kiyomi Schmidt, who is also behind the scenes, who will share more about that. Before then, we'll watch another video, two minutes. Let's see it. <laughs> So we just watched a video and um, about the Global Friends, and I'm going to pull up a few additional slides as well. So here we have a flyer here. You can see becoming a Global Friend and um, all the organizations that were featured in the video are committed to different aspects of peace. So we have those who are serving countries and those in need. Um, we focus on cultural understanding. There's several organizations on strengthening family um, and marital relationships, investing in our youth. Um, there's also organizations on unlocking our own potential and deepening our sense of purpose through spirituality and so much more. So this is our way to highlight different organizations that believe peace is important and hopefully to all those who are watching, it'll give you an extra little bit of confidence to check them out and go and support these organizations. So those who are a global friend, let's see, agree to various peace tenants, um, including several of the topics that we've been weaving into today's program, such as affirming women's value and um, having peace and prosperity for generations to come. We're talking about uplifting that next generation as peace leaders. And um, if you do have an organization and you would like to apply, um, there are several benefits included. And, yeah. and um, some of those include promotion alongside Global Women's Peace Network programming, such as this event today, and also, as you saw, um, you would have a customized landing page about your work on our Women's Federation for World Peace website as well. So to those who would like to find out more and also to apply, we have our 
website link here, wfwp.us slash global friends. That's where you can find out more. And don't worry, we'll email this out to you after the program as well, so you can take a closer look. And um, thank you so much. Back to you, Angelica. Oh, yes. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, Kiyomi. Well done, ladies. Uh, Kiyomi was the creator of most of this, just to mention that. We have amazing young talents here with us. So thank you very much. And the next thing is we do want to really highlight and honor our founder this month, Dr. Hak Chahan Moon, who is called the Mother of Peace and who is definitely one of the great women peace leaders of our time. There's no question about it. And as always, we introduce her memoirs that was they were recently published uh, about a year ago and uh, became bestseller in Korea. And so today, I'm so thrilled to actually introduce a young woman leader who will be giving reflections on the memoirs that are called uh, Women, no, sorry, Mother of Peace and God Shall Wipe Away their, All Their Tears. Her name is Mrs. Diane Heck. And just a brief word about her. I'm gonna read it here. Diane is 23 and a registered nurse student at Mount, Mount St. Mary School of Nursing. She worked as a youth and young adult minister for three years and as a, a youth pastor for two years. Currently, she is a sub-regional coordinator for a youth and young adult organization called Yeyem, works as a nursing assistant and recently started her own business with her husband. How about that? She's very passionate about the healthcare field with the goal of becoming a DNP starting her own medical practice and opening a school where health is well taught, especially to women, and where God's word can be incorporated. That's beautiful. Diane also plans to open a nursing home in the US and eventually other countries. She has big plans and big vision. Let us welcome Diane Heck. Welcome, Diane. The floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Yes, I do have big plans. I hope that God will lead me to them. But uh, yeah, so I was called to at least share um, this book, what I learned from it. Um, yeah, let me just say without Mother Moon, we wouldn't be here today because she is the reason why we're here. Um, the reason why we started, right, Women's Federation. I think as a young woman, I, there's a lot that I learned from this book, you know, Mother's, uh, Mother of Peace. Um, but one thing that I learned is that the biggest thing is to know who you are. That's powerful. I think Mother Moon, um, in her book, everything that she has done in her life, you know, and all the suffering that she's been through, and she was patient and she she really came closer to God because she knew who she was, right? And that's that's really powerful. I think her power comes from her her um, ability to know who she is as God's daughter. Um, and I, I think that's what I that's why I look up to her. It's that that one thing of like of looking at myself and and just you know it's it's just hard to explain, but it's it I, I really feel um God's power when I look at her. And have you have you ever felt like you sometimes when I when I, I hear Mother Mother Moon speaking or you know even see her in like you know videos or it's just, I just have so much power and comfort and, and warmth and love, you know, that, that just comes into my heart. And it, it's like, it's, a, it's like a mother. I guess that's why she's called Mother of Peace, because she's a mother. And that's what I feel every time I, I, I hear her, every time I, I, I read her book. And just her story is filled with, with tears with sorrow, but again, at the end of the day, that one power of knowing who she was, you know, as God's daughter, that's what led her here. And that's why she even, you know, started this whole women's federation. It's because of, she, she turned her passion into a purpose. 
And that's also one thing she actually talks about in her book, how she was able to turn her, 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 her love for humankind. You know, she turned it into a purpose. Like that was her drive because she wanted to change the world and she wanted to become someone who can embrace all, all humankind. And I just, I want to become like her. All right. <laughs> you know, that, that, that one, you know, it's, it's, um, I had the chance to, to one time I, I met her and I was very close to her and as she was praying, I couldn't stop shedding tears. It's amazing. You know, it's amazing because it's not just about the book. It's not just about what she says, but it's about how she says it and her, her, her heart of how she's saying it or where it's coming from. You know, because many times we can have, you know, you can have a lot of people talk about God, but, and talk about their story. But I think with Mother Moon and this book of Mother of Peace, it's not just about the, the words that she's saying, but it's where it's coming from in her heart, um, her deep heart for humanity and for, for, um, for all of us here. And yeah, I, I just, there's a lot to share about her, but, um, yeah, it's all As right. a young, <laughs> there's a lot to share. There's a lot to share because I really look up to Mother Moon. I really feel that I am the woman that I am today because of her. And I, I learned by reading her story, her biography, you know, and I, I, I finally understood that I'm God's daughter. And because of that, I have so much power. And that's not just because of myself. That's because I learned from her and I learned from her, her book and her history and what she's, you know, she went through. And that's why I think this is related to the poem that um, I think I forgot her name. It was Anna, Anna, Lynn. Anna Lynn. Yeah. Anna Lynn shared about being patient as well. I think patience is also a powerful, powerful gift that we have been, we as women have been given by God, you know, being patient. And I think with also Mother Moon in her book, you know, sharing that she, she always shared that, um, no matter the circumstances, no matter what painful situation she was going through, she was patient because she's, she knew the blessing will come. And she knew that, you know, this light, she will finally see this light. Um, and yeah, I just, I just wanted to read something just, you know, from, from this and just to conclude this because I don't want it to be long I talk when I talk about mother moon I talk for I know long. it's hard to stop right <laughs> but, <laughs> I yeah. will I will read this right. it's just sure very that. short sure so uh this is the it's a short um message and she talks about a mother's hand um soothes a stomach ache and she says mommy mommy my stomach hurts when a child complains of stomach ache, his mother lays him on her lap and rub his, rubs his tummy without a single word. Her hands may be gnarled and rough, but in a few moments, the child feels better. This may be a simple approach, but it is a practice based on love. We all dimly remember our mother's warm touch. This is the very touch with which I long to embrace all of humankind as a mother of the universe and a mother of peace. As we know from our own experience, a mother hears her child's cry very clearly and she has no thought but to quickly run to her child. This is because a mother's love and attention are directed solely towards her children. A mother will walk through a fiery pit without hesitation to, say, to save her child. Beautiful. And oh man, okay, I'm gonna cry. We have to, we have to move on, Diane. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. Anyways, that's um. I just wanted to share that. Please, please, just uh, read her story, and I, I think it will. Make, it, it really it makes a difference in our personal life, and I think it can bring a lot of changes if we learn from her. So, yeah. Thank you. That was awesome. Uh, people said you will be a great woman leader. You already are, bravo. <laughs> and thank you for opening the window to the book by reading this very, very special quote in the mother's heart. I just wanna make a comment. You know, when uh, Diane said the Women's Federation was founded by her, that tells you something about the founder and the, 
the gist of where we're going, where we come from, from a place of deep spirituality, yet social action and embrace of a mother's heart. That is the hallmark of the Women's Federation for World Peace. And it's also expressed in the Global Women Peace Network, which we are expanding to the world. So thank you again, Diane, it was profound. Uh, I know there's more, sorry. <laughs> but uh, maybe it is a good uh, introduction to our memoir giveaway moment here, because that happens every single time. We are going to give away three free books. Okay, you want to get one. And uh, we will ask you to put hashtag in the uh, chat box, drum roll. Okay. And uh, just to mention, this only applies to women in North America, not beyond, I'm sorry. But anyone here is qualified to apply and to, to be part of the competition. So you put hashtag. He starts with me. Go. He starts with me. Okay. Oh, do we have some winners? <laughs> this is Mother Moon's memoir. It it has it's, it's chock full of wisdom, of life wisdom that is really rarely found elsewhere. I have to say that myself. So anyway, we will contact the winners via email. You'll get the book. And then we hope if you have already a book, share it with someone else. And so my dear, wonderful ladies and gentlemen who are supporting us today, being with us, I think it was one of the richest sessions we've ever had. Would you not say that, right? This is a great round of applause for the next generation of rising women leaders right here with us and also behind us. Uh, before I introduce them, I just want to say we'll meet again next month, April 14th, um, probably talking about the health and healing will be the next topic. And so without further ado, and don't go away yet, we're going to have a group picture, okay? But before then, I'd like to reveal to you who is behind the scenes, our amazing staff. Can they please come forth? And also our speakers one more time. Let us highlight our amazing speakers, all of them. Can you wave your hands to speakers and our staff, especially we have Angie with the red sweater there. She was on the video of the Korean young artist. Uh, she's our national global women peace network assistant. We have Kiyomi Schmidt, our outreach director, in the blue, excellent job. And uh, also we have our great panelists one more time, uh, Ms. Elizabeth Young, where are you? Uh, waving, there she is the mother of future lawyers, <laughs> guidance <laughs> for peace. <laughs> and uh, uh, Miss Hanalyn Colvin, a great uh, transformer of lives through her art of the word. The word is art. So ladies, thank you very much again. I do want to mention Diane one more time. Thank you for coming on and for sharing with us the heart behind it all, the mother of peace. So ladies, that's it. And let's have a great, great month ahead. Happy Easter. Happy Hanukkah, not Hanukkah, what is it? Uh, uh, Passover. <laughs> Whatever else you're celebrating, most of all, celebrate your beautiful, God-given, divine femininity. It's in all of you. You're all beautiful. We're all divine daughters of God. We can shine. Let your light shine. May that have been an inspiration and an impetus to really go out and share your talents with the world. Don't be shy, okay? <laughs> Just do it. <laughs> so with that being said, thank you for all those who joined us and uh, have a wonderful rest of the week. Thank you so much. Bye.